Oh, it's on. Great. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the Code Manifesto um, and how we can empower our community. Um, so first off, who am I? For anyone who doesn't know, I'm Kayla Daniels. Um, that's my Twitter handle. Feel free to follow me. I'm very insightful. Um, I'm a senior platform engineer for Refinery29 in New York. I am a member of the League of Extraordinary Packages. I represent OmniPay, which is a um, payment gateway abstraction library. And I'm a member of the FIG on behalf of the League. I am the US lead of PHP Women. And probably most importantly, I'm a mommy. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So what are you going to expect in this talk? Uh, I want to talk about community, equality, diversity, and respect. We're going to talk about what's the problem, why it matters, and some possible things on what we can do to fix it. So first off, what, what's the problem? This is a quote that I made about a year ago um, at a conference in Laracon. And yes, for anyone wondering, it is completely legit to quote yourself in your own slides. Um, so about a year ago in New York, I spoke at Laracon. Um, and it was actually the birth of the Code Manifesto. And I said that the industry that I work in is not the industry that I want to work in. So in a nutshell, our industry is grossly lacking in diversity. The minorities that we do have are being pushed out every day. Now, I can say uh, I'm a bit of an outsider to the Joomla community. This is my first Joomla event. Um, and I am absolutely enthused about the amount of diversity here. There are a lot more ladies at this conference than I've ever seen at any other conference, and you guys get a big plus one from me on that. It's beautiful to see. Well done. <clears throat> so this problem that we have, it's kind of twofold. You've got a pipeline problem, and you've got a culture problem. So the pipeline, we're lacking diversity. We don't have enough minorities coming in. Culture problem, the minorities that are here are being pushed out. So let's talk about the pipeline a little bit. Lots of studies have been done. There's lots of research. You've probably seen all the articles. There's tons of articles that come out about this. Um, recently, we're hearing 12% of computer science bachelor's degrees are going to women in 2010, 2011. 12%. It's a very small number. Um, another study said community college through PhD level. So this is the entire spectrum of continuing education. 7.5% went to blacks. 6.2% went to Hispanics. Now these slides that we're going to go through, I'm going to go through them rather fast. The numbers don't really matter. What I want you to look at is the large, darker brown segments. Look kind of Pac-Man, right? Twitter, Facebook, Google, Apple, LinkedIn, Yahoo. We go back through those, what do you notice? Those big Pac-Man-y shapes don't change much through all of them. And on each side, that represents white and male, on each side respectively. So you can see that the majority of our workforce in computer science, in these big companies that employ tons of people, primarily white, primarily man. But are these really the problems, or are these the symptoms of the problems? Let's go a little farther back. How far? Legos. Look at these. These are amazing. This is stuff that I wish that I owned, and I don't, and that's a real problem for me. Um, and this is, this is the, the toys that we represent to our boys. This is what they get. They get really cool, like, Batmobiles and Star Wars stuff. And then, for any of you who have daughters or have ever been unfortunate enough to walk into the girls' aisle, you get this. <laughs> You're bombarded by an offensive amount of pink stuff. This is what you get. So Legos, it seems trivial, it seems small, but Legos actually help build your um, spatial reasoning and your problem-solving skills from a very small level. So as soon as you've got blocks and you're trying to put them together and you're trying to stack things, that's building your problem-solving skills. And this, for me, as a mommy, as I talked about, I have a mother, I have three kids, uh, this was a real eye-opener for me, because I have two boys and I have a daughter. And I never realized that, you know, I was conditioning my kids from very young 
that my boys were learning problem solving and my daughter was learning nurturing. And there's nothing wrong with learning nurturing and there's nothing wrong with the, the gender normalized toys. And I'm not saying that we should force all of our daughters to play with Legos and that will solve the problem. But it's something that we should be aware of because it's happening. It's something that's um, underlined and enforced kind of insidiously in our culture. Talking about that culture, it's the second part of the, the problem that, we, that I mentioned earlier. We have the pipeline problem, we have the culture problem. So I see, when I look out there, I see two kinds of discrimination that you have within our community. And this isn't necessarily the Joomla community, but you know, the computer science community as a whole. You've got the one type that's disgusting. It's absolutely awful. It has an almost benefit of it's usually easy to spot. No matter who you are, generally, you can look at it and you can say that's bad. These are things like death threats, rape threats, hate speech. And I don't know if you guys see the same things that I see on Twitter, but I see this stuff. Unspeakable things that are told to women and other minorities. So if you can imagine, I'm a Twitter addict. I love the Twitter. My phone goes off and I'm like, yes! Somebody said something to me, this is fantastic. And I grab my phone and I unlock it and I open the Twitter app. And could you imagine what it would feel like to have that on there? To have somebody that you don't know or that you do know feel like they can say those things to you and have it delivered right into your palm where you can see it. And I guarantee you that if you got tweets, as trivial and stupid as that may seem, if you got tweets like that, that would follow you and haunt you all the time. But that's usually pretty easy to see. Like, that's a problem. You should not threaten to kill or rape people. Then you have the other type. This is insidious and ingrained. It's very hard to spot, and it's really, really hard to explain. So these are the things where people go, well, is that really sexist? Really? Is that a problem? Generally, my baseline for this is if you have to ask, is this sexist, it is more than likely, yes, this is sexist. So I want to walk you through. Um, you know, I can't speak from the position of a lot of minorities because I'm not them, but I'm a girl. I've been a girl for about 27 half years now. I have a lot of experience at this, fairly well versed. I can tell you some things that you hear as a girl developer. And I actually just did, while I was getting ready for my talk, um, a little Twitter poll to get some, some more insight into this, to other things. So we'll go through some of the things that I heard on Twitter that are just magnificent. You're a developer? You're a girl? You're a unicorn. I had a dime for every time somebody called me a unicorn. You're the first woman I've worked with and I'm really impressed by how competent you are. I've gotten this twice from coworkers who thought they were paying me a compliment. I should be, I should be thankful. You're a pretty good coder for a girl. Anytime you ever have to say anything or feel like you want to say anything and suffix, with it, <clears throat> suffix it with for a girl, stop. Hard stop. Girls don't like to solve problems. <laughs> Pardon my French? Bullshit. Girls make great front-end developers because they like to make things pretty. Number one. I couldn't tell you if something was pretty. I couldn't design my way out of a box. Bootstrap exists for people like me. Number two, front-end developers don't just make things pretty, they make things work. They're very talented people that I am in awe of because I could never ever do what these people do and it's a lot more than make things pretty. And girl plus pretty is not the same thing. So these are all things that I've personally heard as a girl developer. Now, according to Twitter this morning, you also get things like, I don't know, you're about to keynote a speech, and people are like, oh, so are you here with your boyfriend? No, no, I'm not, but thank you. Or you go into a conversation, and someone goes, oh, I'm sorry, is this too technical for you? <laughs> no, no, it's not. Um, I've actually had a situation where I had a, a coworker in the middle of explaining something, he was talking about fuzzy search, in the middle of explaining this, he goes, oh, wait, wait, you do know what fuzzy search is, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do. 
It's all of these things. And there's the added, the added pressure of, have you ever sat in a job? You've gotten a job. You're like, yes, getting jobs is amazing. This is great. And then you have that momentary doubt of, did I get this because I earned it? Because I worked really hard for it? Or because I happen to be a girl and they need to up their diversity stats? A lot of people, you don't have to worry about that. But I do. Every time I get a job. Every time I get a speaking engagement. There's that worry in the back of your head of, did I earn this? Because I worked really, really hard over a lot of years to earn this like to think that I earned it, and it's hard to dispel that voice that maybe this is just being given to me because I'm a girl. Now, why does all of this matter? I'd like to ask you, what do you do for a living? I can tell you what I do for a living. I do magic. Like that. Yeah. I take ideas, and I type some things on a keyboard, and then I make them happen. I make people's lives easier. I help people make money. That's what all of us do. It's magic. 20 years, 50 years ago, this stuff was literally like, whoo, never heard of it. The idea that I could take my phone and say, OK, Google, where's Walmart? And I have instructions on how to get there? That's magic. And that's what we do for a living. We have more flexibility. We have pretty good pay. And we're in high demand. I don't know about all of you, but I get at least three or four recruiters a week emailing me and saying, please, please let me give you a job. And when you think about the number of people out there who are unemployed or underemployed, the positions that we hold, that's amazing. And these are the kinds of positions that are unreachable or uninhabitable by a lot of minorities. I told you we talk about this again. I'm a mommy. I talk about this a lot. These three little people are my little people. I made them. And I love them. And if you notice, the two on the end are boys. And that gem in the middle, she's a girl. Her name's Lydia. She's nine. She's amazing. So what are we going to tell our kids? I look at my sons and I tell them, you can do anything you want. You want to play sports, you want to do computers, you want to do art, anything you want, but not you. You can do most things, but some things are going to be really hard. And I can look at her and I can tell her what my dad told me. And my dad's an amazing man and also a huge nerd and he taught me most of what I knew about computers at a very young age. I could type almost before I could write. He was an amazing man. And he told me things like, you're going to have to have a tough skin, thick skin, kid. Chin up, kid. Don't listen to them. And I listened to my dad, and I didn't listen to the idiots. And I got a thick skin, and I kept my chin up, and I got to where I am. And I'm happy, and I'm successful, and that's great. And every day, I have to listen to idiots that say things like, for a girl. And now I have to look at the prospect of my nine-year-old daughter maybe wanting to do what I do. We do Python together because she wants to learn to code and she's a little Kano computer, so I teach her Python. And I look at her and I think, in 20 years, the rest of this world better shape up. It's got to get ready for my daughter. It has to be worthy for my daughter and for all of your daughters and for all of the daughters out there because they don't deserve to put up with what I put up with, ever. You also have invisible minorities. It's easy to see that I'm a girl. It's usually easy to tell if somebody's African American or Asian or another minority. But there are invisible minorities out there that you can't see and that you'll never see. I suffer from bipolar disorder and depression. It's still hard for me to say on stage, but I do. Um, and there's a hashtag on there. I run an organization called Hack the Stigma um, to help raise awareness for mental disorders and people in develop, uh, development. In short, you don't know what it took for someone to get where they are. 
and maybe where they are is on stage in front of a bunch of people, which is kind of scary. You don't know what it took for me to get up here. But there are smaller victories. There are days when getting out of bed is the most I can do. And it takes a lot. And there are days when getting out of bed is not something I can do, no matter how hard I try. So you've got somebody sitting in front of you who managed to get out of bed and come to work. They're wearing clothes. This is an achievement. And you don't know what it took for them to get there. So you better be nice to them. You have imposter syndrome. Is anyone here familiar with imposter syndrome? It's a feeling that you're faking it. Any success you have is due to luck. That comes back to the, did I earn this, or is it because I'm a girl? Or because I fooled them? Or because I'm lucky? I'm just going to lie until they don't notice anymore. You don't really know what you're doing. I think a lot of people feel this. I know I do every single day. Studies actually show that this is more prevalent in women and persons of color. Could it be possibly because we hear constantly that we don't belong here? So obviously we don't think that we can do it. It kind of contributes. It plays hand in hand with these things. I have this idea of something called a worth it scale. Everybody starts out their career with a scale and it's empty. You have some pros and you have some cons. So in the pros, you get magic and passion. I love what I do. And I'm learning constantly. That's one of the best things about my career is there's never a day where I don't learn something. And I get to solve problems, really. Even though I'm a girl, I do this. And then you get some disrespect. And you get tired. And you get harassed. And then you get self-doubt. And eventually that worth it scale tips in the other direction, and the cons outweigh the pros, and you leave, because it's simply not worth it anymore. Women are leaving our industry at nearly two times the rate of men. So we can't get them in, and once we get them in, we can't make them stay. And then you have something called intersectionality. And this is something that I've read on and I've studied, and I can't speak to it fully personally, but the idea is that you can't understand the experience of, say, you have a female person of color. You can't understand just by having the idea of what it is to be a person of color and of what it is to be a woman and have those two identities separate. It compounds. You have this intersectionality that makes it that much worse. And all of these things play a factor into each of our paths that we walk in our industry. And it's a real problem. So what can we do to fix it? First thing I like to, to point out and really underline this because it is very, very important. This is not a woman problem. It's not a minority problem. And it's not a man's problem. This is an everyone problem. We are all suffering from it, and we can all fix it. But we have to work together. And you have things that like anti-solutions. Now, in our field, we're pretty familiar with anti-patterns. So they look or sound good. They don't actually solve the problem. More often than not, they will hurt you more than they will help you. So what are some anti-solutions to this problem? The shiny unicorn syndrome, which I've experienced. Oh my god, you're a shiny unicorn. Kitty gloves, which I've also experienced. And that being, I've sat down in a code review with myself and other developers. A uh, male coworker puts his code up on the screen and everyone rips into it. This is absolute crap, this is horrible, you don't know what you're doing. Oh my god, this is awful. And then I put my code up on the screen and they go, well, you tried. I don't need kitty gloves. I don't want you to be mean to me, but I don't want you to be nicer to me than everyone else because you think that my delicate sensitivities can't handle it. I can handle it. Just treat me like everybody else. Girlifying programming, also known as pinkwashing. Let's pinkwash everything. 
Um, Google did something last year around this time. I think it was called like Girls Who Code or something. It was a big national event. And they had things set up on teaching girls how to like 3D print jewelry and, and how to program dresses and things of this nature. And that's great and that's fine and sure, yeah, I guess, you know, meet them where they are. But if you sat down with a nine-year-old me and told me that I could, I don't know, organize my chores with programming, that's pretty awesome. I could make a robot to fold my laundry. That's pretty freaking awesome. You know, I tell little girls that they can solve problems, big problems, little problems, any problems. Tell them that, and that will inspire them. You do not need to tell them that they can make jewelry or shoes. Believe it or not, girls like to solve problems. Tell them that they can do that. Don't pinkwash it. Furthermore, quotas are bad. Period. End of story. All quotas are bad. This only contributes to the fear that I'm up here because I'm filling a quota, or I have a job because I'm filling a quota. Quotas are bad, and there are better ways to do it. I talk about this a lot. I campaign for it a lot. I do not support any conferences or companies that have female quotas. We deserve a lot better than that. <clears throat> you don't need to be a minority to empower minorities. I get a lot of, you know, I'm a white guy and I want to help, but I don't think I can help. No, you, you can help. Advocacy, empowerment, encouragement. All of this happens through earnest engagement. So it's not trying to help someone because they are a girl, and only because they are a girl, but having a simple one-on-one -on -one conversation with another human being, regardless of their gender, regardless of their skin color, just engage with people, and you would not believe how much that can go towards fixing this problem. So about a year ago, we just uh, I just reached a one-year anniversary, May 14th, actually. I came up with the idea of something called the Code Manifesto. Code Manifesto is a set of values, not actions. Um, I had actually originally written it as actions. Do this, do that, don't do this. And a friend of mine pointed out that it's really hard to get people to do things. And it's much easier to outline some values and let them incorporate that into their lives as they see fit. So it's a set of eight values. It's got two major themes, respect and giving back. So number one, discrimination limits us, plain and simple. It's number one for a reason. It's what I feel is the most important. For women specifically, if you're immediately disqualifying half, the por half of the population, it's nothing short of insane. That's absolutely ridiculous. So this includes discrimination on the base of race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, nationality, and any other arbitrary exclusion of a group of people. Uh, this list was actually a lot smaller when I originally wrote it. The Code Manifesto is completely open source, and I've accepted a lot of different pull requests from a lot of people much smarter than I am um, that have increased my knowledge on, on the different kinds of discrimination that are seen that I haven't personally experienced, and I am forever grateful for that. Number two, boundaries honor us. So everybody's boundaries are different, and it's healthy to have them. It's just healthy to, to respect them. So what I'm offended by might not offend someone else. What they're offended by might not offend me. Everybody's different, and it's just important to understand that. If somebody brings it to your attention, hey, that offended me, you respect it. It's, Pretty straightforward. We, our, we are our biggest asset. So I don't know about any of you, but I was not born knowing everything that I know. It's been a very long journey to get here, and I've learned from a lot of people a lot smarter than I am. So return that favor. The person that you learned from, you now get to be in their shoes and teach somebody else. You can do that in a lot of different ways. Write a blog, answer a question on Stack Overflow, write a screencast, give a talk, make an open source package, help a friend, talk at a conference, 
There's a million different ways that we can help each other, but it's very important that we do it. And future looking, we're also the resources for the future. So be mindful every day that you, each and every one of you, are the role models for the next generation. My kid, any one of the three of them, could be looking up to any one of you. So make yourself a resource for them. Respect defines us. This is pretty simple. It's kind of a good friend of mine said the only thing more ridiculous than being told how to act like this is the fact that we need to be told how to act like this. So treat others like you want to be treated. Make your discussions and your criticisms and your debates from a position of respectfulness. And yes, this does mean online. On the internet, it still requires this amount of respect. Just because you're in the comment box of an article or you're on Reddit does not disqualify you from needing to be a respectful adult. Before you type something, before you press enter, before you send that tweet, ask yourself, is this true? Is it necessary? Is it constructive? Anything less than that really shouldn't be tolerated. Reactions require grace. This isn't necessarily the one that I think is the most important, but it certainly is my favorite. Because developers, we seem to think that everything needs to be turned up to 11. So let's, let's go through this. Things that are OK to be turned to 11. We've got curiosity, passion, love for what you do. Things that are not OK. Hatred, anger, burn it with fire. Pretty much this is how we do. Somebody on the internet said something I don't like, and immediately it's, you should lose your job, and I hate you, and you're a despicable person, and you should burn in fire. No. All right, number seven, opinions are just that. They're opinions. This one was actually contributed by a friend of mine on Twitter called Artisan Goose. Um, and I asked him to give his background on why he thought this was important to be inc included. Um, so it encourages an environment where people understand that every person is different in more ways than one. So there's an old saying, opinions are kind of like elbows. Everyone has at least one. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're having a discussion about what's better, active record or data mapper pattern, Everyone's entitled to their opinion, and it doesn't mean that you're the scourge of the earth because you have it. Number eight is also a newer one. To err is human. So guess what? We all make mistakes. Some mistakes are just mistakes. If I had a dime for every time that I put my foot in my mouth, I would have a lot of dimes. And this happens to me on Twitter and on Facebook and in person and all the time. I say really ridiculous, stupid things. And sometimes I say discriminatory things. Even though I wrote this and even though I'm really passionate about it, sometimes I say things that are just, what? Mistakes are just mistakes. We all need to be able to make mistakes. That's professionally and personally in our code and in our interactions. It needs to be okay to make mistakes. And hatred rarely inspires growth. So if I make a mistake and I immediately get the turn up to 11 response of you should burn with fire, I'm probably never going to make that mistake again. But I'm also probably never going to put myself out there again because I'm scared of that up to 11 response. I don't want to get hated on again. And we all need to be able to do that. Put yourself out there to try new things, to have conversations with the understanding that if you make a mistake and somebody points it out, you can accept that. That, in a nutshell, in eight values, is what the Code Manifesto is. Supporting it isn't enough. Right now, I have, uh, there's 495 um, supporters on the Code Manifesto, and you can Support it on codemanifesto.com. Um, those 495 people blow me away. It absolutely amazes me. Uh, but that's putting your name into a form on the internet is not enough. When I wrote it, I never thought that, you know, making a website on the internet would amazingly, you know, tomorrow everything's fixed. Yay. You have to live it. You have to remember it. And you have to keep it top of mind. And I try to. Every day when I'm 
interacting with other people, I try to think about these things. They run through my mind. Is it necessary? Is it constructive? And that helps. It helps to frame the way that I interact with other people. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean that I don't mess up. But I try. And it helps. Other things that you can do. Stand up. Every time. This is probably the most important thing you can do. There's a saying that says, all it takes for evil to exist is for good men to do nothing. That's good people, not just men. So when you hear somebody saying, for a girl, stand up. Point out that that is absolutely and utterly completely ridiculous every single time. And it's not always comfortable, and it's not always easy, and it doesn't always feel good, and sometimes it's your best friend that's doing it. And that's even less easy and less comfortable. But do it anyway. Stand up. Know your own bias. So this is something that was actually really difficult for me when I started going through this, to understand the places in which I am biased. Um, and so I sat down and I started thinking about it, and it turns out that at the time, I've had a year to work through this. I think I've gotten better. But at the time, um, I found I had this bias against older people for some reason. I was, I was in a hiring position, or a, a, not a hiring position, I was part of the team that made a decision on hiring people. We were doing a lot of interviews, and when someone you know, 50 or older would walk in, I would immediately think, like, clearly, they're on like PHP 4. We're done. <laughs> and that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's no more preposterous, more or less preposterous, than me walking into a room and them thinking I don't know what I'm doing because I'm a girl. But that was my own bias. And I had to own up to it, fix it. I got better. I don't think that anymore, just for anyone wondering, I don't. But that was one of the journeys that I had to go through to understand my own bias. Own your privilege. This one was really difficult for me at first, also. Um, it's hard for me to say. For me, the privilege has the immediate connotation of I've been given something. Like, I didn't work for everything that I have. I've been given something. And that was really hard for me to, to understand, to accept, to grok. Um, but it's true. I mean, on some level, each of us has been given something. Each of us has a certain level of privilege. I have an immense amount of privilege to work in the industry in which I do, to have the lifestyle in which I do, to fly to Prague and speak in front of you people as I am. That's privilege. And it's something that not everyone has. And to be mindful of that, to understand that is important. All right, so that is what I've got. And you'll have to excuse me. We'll go. I think that link is not right. Sorry. I will tweet out the updated link. That joined in link did not get saved when I saved. <coughs> anyway, Code Manifesto, that's my Twitter handle. Um, I'd love to continue this conversation elsewhere. Anywhere, you can find me on Twitter literally 24 hours a day. I don't actually sleep. <laughs> um, and I think I have a couple minutes for questions if anyone has them. Questions? Bueller? No? Okay. Okay.
Uh, well, two things. Number one, I frequently refer to myself as a girl, so the whole men and women thing, whatever. <laughs> um, and I'm the U.S. lead for PHP Women, so I might be a bit biased here. Um, I actually, right before I wrote the Code Manifesto, <clears throat> it came about as a catalyst because I was very upset um, about seeing things like Girls Who Code, and I was getting lots of emails or for like, intro to HTML for girls. What is different? Like, are there literally different markup tags that happen to apply to women? Yeah, like what, what is this? Um, and I've, I've since learned a lot about it. So PH, PHP Women specifically is a completely inclusive group. The, the name um, is really just to help us make more visible for women, but it's not for women specifically. We also um, are very inclusive of men and, and anyone else who wants to join. Um, and I'm very proud to be a representative of PHP Women. Um, for the other groups, Girls Who Code and, and things of that nature, um, it's important to give minorities a place where they can feel inclusive. Personally, uh, I don't think that making siloed communities like that is necessarily making the community as a whole uh, more inclusive, but baby steps. It's a baby step in the right direction. If we can at least get them into the field in a place where they feel comfortable and they can grow and share, that's one step in the right direction. Um, Ideally, in the future, I would prefer it if we didn't have to have girls groups. If we could just have groups where girls feel included. Unfortunately, right now, that's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? I need to look that up. I, I do apologize. Uh, my slides are fairly American biased because I'm an American. But um, no, I, I definitely do want to do some research on that and see if, if it changes. Um, I know other countries have different um, education systems and that might play a big role. Um, I will look that up and get back to you. Baby steps. We'll get there. We'll get there someday. But it's it's really important and valuable that we have these places that women can be um, comfortable and safe. Yeah. Thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it. you've been an amazing group.